Welcome to this uh, session on confronting the challenges of catastrophic outbreaks. Um, and uh, just for, uh, you know, for those who uh, need it, there is simultaneous translation, uh, English, French, um, because the uh, president of uh, Guinea uh, will uh, give his remarks uh, in French. Um, I'm Peter Piot, and I'm the director of the uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And uh, we have a most distinguished and experienced panel this afternoon. And let me briefly uh, introduce them. Starting here on my left is uh, Dr. Paul Stoffels, who is the Chief Scientific Officer and Worldwide Chairman Pharmaceuticals of Johnson & Johnson. And Paul is, I would say, a serial entrepreneur and unique among pharma executives, the fact that he has worked on the ground in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. We have um, Dr. Margaret Chan, um, no need to introduce, but Director General of WHO, with, um, after a uh, distinguished career in public health in Hong Kong and globally. Then we have um, President uh, Alpha Condé, who is a political scientist and the first democratically elected president of uh, his country of Guinea. Uh, and as you know, one of the three most affected countries by the Ebola epidemic. We have Seth Berkeley, you could hear him uh, this afternoon uh, when he spoke in the plenary on the uh, 15th uh, birthday of uh, Gavi, the Gavi Alliance, of which he is the CEO, but he was also the founding CEO of IAVI, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. And last but not least, we have Tony Elumelu, uh, entrepreneur and philanthropist from Nigeria and founder of the Tony Elumelu Foundation. The objective of this uh, session is to briefly review the Ebola epidemic that's still going on, but particularly um, to look forward and to answer the question, what critical questions, uh, lessons uh, have we learned and um, to debate how to respond to similar outbreaks. So I would say let's um, make this into a forward-looking uh, panel. We have about one hour. The Ebola epidemic uh, in West Africa uh, has been really a black swan event, uh, I would say, together now with the Swiss franc uh, revaluation. And uh, because there have been 25 outbreaks um, and uh, before this one in West Africa, and they were all very, very different from the current one. Um, they were occurring in Central Africa. Um, they, you know, and now in, we have this first outbreak in West Africa affecting entire nations capital cities. It's been going on for uh, more than a year in the case of, uh, of Guinea. And whereas definitely there's some good news, the number of cases is going down everywhere, um, it's not over by uh, any means. And we'll hear about that, what the priorities are. And it will only be over when the last person with Ebola is either dead or recovered without having infected uh, other people. So that's quite a daunting task. Now, predicting the future, as we all know, is very difficult, but one thing is sure, there will be other Ebola outbreaks and there will be other uh, epidemics, not the least of influenza. So let's start uh, uh, the conversation. Uh, Monsieur le Président, um, vous avez été très actif dans la lutte contre Mr. President, uh, you have been very active in this fight against the Ebola epidemic. What lessons do you think one can draw from your experience in Guinea as well as in other parts? Well, thank you very much for that question. There are other questions that should be put as well. The speed at which Ebola has spread surprised the world, which was not at all prepared to fight Ebola. Ebola existed in Central Africa in a very restricted area, but Ebola spread in a very surprising way so that it was impossible to, to control it and there was little understanding of the mechanism. One didn't explain to the patients that Ebola is a very, very serious epidemic, but that one can uh, be cured from Ebola. International communication was disastrous because it was more panic creating than anything else. International mobilization only really took place as of September last year, but now we know exactly what has to be done to fight against Ebola, and we know what it is. There are three countries in particular 
So we have to cut the, the chain of contamination so that one country does not contaminate or infect another. Secondly, how can we reach the patients early enough? Because if we can treat a patient early enough, there's a great chance of recovering. And thirdly, how to keep patients from having any contact with anyone else for 21 days. So Ebola itself causes less danger than behavior. If you close the borders, then you only isolate Ebola, but not what happens within a country. In Guinea, there are all sorts of organizations that uh, come in when there is a case, and there are many people, organizations who are used to, to dealing with refugees, with migrating people. But the organizations have not really understood that Ebola is a different kind of fight, and that one has to give up the old methods and adopt new ones. And this has taken a long time, this learning curve. Also, coordination. One has to understand that Ebola is now able to reach out to anyone in the world. The world has become very small. So we have to have these new methods of fighting, of combating Ebola. So we need to think of new structures with which we can contend with Ebola. Our countries don't have the same kind of health systems as others do. We've uh, taken time to detect the, the organism. We had to send the virus to the Pasteur Institute for analysis and we have to have a better health system in our countries if we want to control Ebola and um, eradicate it. We need to be able to detect all these different viruses ourselves and not always have to rely on aid from the outside. Now it's Ebola, but it could be any other kind of disease or new disease, but the, the world is simply not able to, or not at present able to fight against such a widespread uh, uh, epidemic. Médecins Sans Frontières was very, very helpful, but there is there are many failings to, to actually deal and, and cope with such an enormous epidemic. Another less lesson to learn is that this epidemic has caused a lot of panic and fear, and that has immense uh, consequences on the financial and economic situation of a country, tourism, in human terms, very many of those who have died have left children behind. There are orphans to, to now look after. And then there are all the customs. We have a certain way of burial, and, and all these things have to be changed and, uh, because of the, the danger of contamination. So first of all, one should not give in to panic, even though the communication is such that it does cause a lot of panic. Many tourists don't even want to go to Central Africa or Kenya anymore because they feel that they are at risk. Africans also have to understand that Africa is like one single country. We need solidarity between the African countries. The problem in Africa is that there's a lack of solidarity. If there's a problem in Nigeria, it's not the whole of Africa that will become mobilized to, to help Nigeria, for example. So we have to coordinate better this fight against Ebola or any other epidemic, strengthen our health systems, public health systems. Everyone has to become mobilized in order to cancel out the debt that the countries have, the ones who have been affected by Ebola. And countries have to, and organizations have to give up their old methods and adopt new ones to see to it that Ebola is dealt with in a new way, in a, with new methods. We have to give up, up our habits. However, these organizations are rooted in their in their habits, their customs, their traditions, and it's difficult for them to turn to new ways. Then there are also interests that the 
states the countries have, for example, my country needs a laboratory or laboratories that can detect things very rapidly. We would need transit centers as well, with, in which we would know in, within 15 minutes whether a person is positive and needs to be treated or isolated or not. We need a lot of discussion, understanding, we need medicine, we need treatments. We feel that the medication should be on the spot. The doctors should not have to wait for so long to get the necessary medication. There's a lot that we can learn from this epidemic. It has shown us that the whole world needs a new early warning system to treat all these diseases and patients, a new way of communication. Uh, France 24 and CNN could help us rather than spreading panic. And we need more solidarity between the African countries, whether it be with regard to Boko Haram, the war in Mali, Ebola, or any other any other problem, or the problem in Namibia. We have to find new answers to these new situations. If that's what I could say at this point. Thank you very much, Mr. President. A good list for uh, um, for discussion. Um, uh, Margaret, um, you know, you've been really also uh, at the forefront. And uh, um, this week, the uh, on Sunday, there will be a special session of uh, your executive board. So, how you see things for the future, and uh, um, what to do for to prepare also for um, the the next epidemics. Thank you, Peter. I think um, President, uh, President Alpha Condi has uh, given you the complexity of this uh, Ebola outbreak in 2014. Clearly, I fully agree with him, the comment that the world is unprepared. And that conclusion was actually drawn in 2011. There was an independent expert group of people who reviewed the global health uh, uh, collective defense system after the 2010 uh, pandemic H1N1. The conclusion at that time was the world is ill-prepared for a severe and sustained severe disease. And this, unfortunately, that conclusion was borne out by the Ebola outbreak that we are seeing um, in particularly in the three countries the most affected. Now, Ebola 2014 is truly unprecedented in terms of the highest number of people affected, and so many of them die. It is truly a tragedy. And also, it is unprecedented in terms of its geographical spread. If I tell you, nine countries in three continents were affected, or reporting cases to WHO. And of course, this is also an outbreak that is lasting the longest period. As we are speaking, we are still managing the outbreak. But I would like to thank the three governments in particular for their truly commitment uh, at the highest political level. We are seeing the downward trend um, in the cases in these three countries. So keep up with your good work, Mr. President. And uh, we would like to continue to see you know, um, total control of Ebola. Now, for Dabit Cho, you're right. On the 25th of January, there will be a special session where member states of the organization, Dabit Cho is an organization with 195 countries who are members, come around to learn lessons from the Ebola and how to better prepare the world. And this time, I think the world's leaders would take heed uh, of the lessons that were drawn in 2011 that I refer to. So basically, let me summarize on the three important areas that I would see that needs to be strengthened. Number one, President Alpha Condi mentioned about it, the health system capacity and preparedness. Do they have the people, the infrastructure, and the system to detect disease early? As we all know, Ebola was undetected, spreading undetected for three months in Guinea. The first case happened in December 2013, and it was not detected or tested until March 2014. And in a highly mobile community where young people 
go around uh, different countries <coughs> to seek employment, the disease is spread. It is important for us to realize that for those of us who travel, we need a visa. But for virus, virus do not need visas to get across the borders. So we do need to support countries to build very strong health system to have the capability to sound early warning. Second point, and I also agree with President Alpha Condi's observation, the international response need to be much better coordinated and in order to support the countries to get to, to do the right thing. And last but not the least, Ebola has been around for 40 years, and yet we are empty-handed in terms of vaccine, drugs, diagnostic, to help us to make the diagnosis sooner, to isolate patients and treat them well, and at the same time do the proper contact tracing to stop the transmission of the diseases. So I would expect member states in WHO would look at you know, these important gaps and how to plug those gaps. And of course, you know, in, inside the big show, we also need to look at, is the big show uh, well capacitated <coughs> to do the kind of work that it is mandated to do? I know countries of the world have a lot of expectation for the big show, and we do need to have a very good discussion on what is the big show and what is not the big show. Uh, people expect us to be a first responder. People expect us uh, to be the uh, fire brigade. And people also expect us to do a lot of things. So we also need to do a better job in terms of communication, explaining to people what we are and what we are not. And how can we, WHO, as an organization, going forward, is better prepare and also with the capacity to co coordinate our actors in the international community, in the UN system, and in others uh, to respond uh, faster to you know, nip the outbreak in the bud. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, big task ahead, but I think that uh, like every crisis, this is an opportunity to get things right. Um, you know, Tony, um, you know, we've heard perspective from government, uh, international organizations. Um, so as, uh, you know, from where you are, both as a business person, a philanthropist, and, uh, you know, um, building perhaps also on Nigeria's successful uh, containment of cases, um, how do you see things? I, I think um, it's good to say that the private sector should have been involved earlier on in the response to Ebola. And listening to the speakers also, I ask myself, this kind of conversation is actually interesting so that we begin to know that there's a lot the private sector can do in helping not necessarily to contain per se, but making sure that we rehabilitate the affected communities as fast as possible as a deterrent for future occurrence in these places. The the, at, uh, in West Africa, we've had certain responses by the private sector, albeit a bit uh, late. We've seen responses by the AU engaging with the private sector in Africa. We've seen responses by the African Development Bank, the President Donald Kebruka is here. We also, in our own group, both at my foundation, have um, we put a million dollars to support the initiative. And beyond that, we also at the, the bank level, one of our businesses. Interestingly, I have business in all the three countries. Uh, but good to note, we did not close shops in any of these places because these communities need hope. And if you close shop, <laughs> you keep the hope. And so uh, we have banking uh, infra facility and banks in these places, and we're operating during the period. If up to now, we never closed for one day, and yet we protected the lives of our staff, that no staff got contaminated at all uh, during the period. But to me, moving forward is what we, I think we can spend a little more time on. Because post Ebola, how do we have to rebuild these communities so that we bring economic hope back and opportunities back to the communities? And also we make sure that the poverty level that to a large extent predisposed these communities to Ebola outbreak will not occur again. So I'd like to at our level, we're engaging. We're trying to see engaging with the countries. 
I spoke uh, and gave the presidents to see how we can help mobilize international community, African Africans, African private sector, so that we make some investments in these countries. And those of us already are operating in this country, let's see how we can expand our economic activities in these countries so that we help to rebuild the communities. I think that the longer sustainability uh, approach to curing this Ebola lies in the private sector's engagement here. Thank you, Tony, and thank you also for continuing to do business because as President Alpha Condé said, you know, some of the measures have been as damaging in a sense as the virus uh, for societies and economies. Um, uh, President Condé said also we need innovation, we need new tools, so on, and, and uh, some of them, are, you know, have to come from the pharmaceutical industry. So, Paul, what is industry doing and um, how do you see the future of, um, you know, your engagement? Well, industry uh, has done a lot of efforts, uh, probably also too late, um, because the epidemic was an epidemic which was in very small focused areas in Africa, 25 outbreaks, something like 1,700 patients or deaths until now, until this outbreak, and suddenly it shows up as a big problem in the world. Um, the reason um, the industry uh, and three companies, Merck, uh, JSK and J&J, and &J, we are active on vaccines. And the reason we are active in vaccines is at a certain time in, 19, um, in, uh, in 2008, uh, the US started a, an activity on bioterrorism. Yeah, and Ebola was one of the of the viruses, which was uh, a bioterror agent, and therefore NIH started research, and that's the reason why we now can accelerate the the, the hopefully I can accelerate the availability of a vaccine. What also was lacking is the platforms and the technologies to do this type of vaccines. And there I consider industry and, and the academic world one and the same. We have, to, uh, we have to do more research in new platforms to be able to bring new, um, new vaccines. And for example, the adenovectors uh, in our uh, group with uh, Crusel Jans and J&J came through a collaboration with, uh, with the vaccine work on, on IAVI, where we were working on an HIV vaccine, and that's why we developed the vectors. All the vectors were developed because of, of the uh, bioterror. And in parallel, production activities need to be done because these new, ve these new vectors need very special... Uh, and for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, is vectors or viruses. What we do is we use a, a cold virus which we make replication deficient. We add a piece of the, the Ebola in there, trick the body, in fact, with the cold virus and have it make also antibodies against Ebola. The same with MVA, which is a, what is called a boosting vector. Uh, exactly the same. It's, an, it's a pox virus. You make it replication deficient. You put a piece of Ebola in and you, uh, and, and you can inject that in patients. In the meantime, what happened? Massive amount of work. I think each of the companies, Merck, JSK and ourselves, we are working on a time frame of 12 months where we are upscaling, doing preclinical work and, and also doing the clinical work, phase one, phase two, phase three. And hopefully within the next six to nine months, there will be vaccines available. Same is happening in drugs. The challenge on doing drug research was that Ebola, you can't work on in the lab. So to find the drug, you need to be able to handle the virus, and it took so long to do that. The same with vaccines, well, uh, sorry, diagnostics was not simple to do that. The industry has massively invested now. Um, in the meantime, we have produced more than 400,000 vaccines, uh, both the vectors and uh, both vectors, prime and boost. The same is happening at JSK and Newlink. A massive acceleration of clinical trials. And I must very much thank all the regulators, all the healthcare officials in each of the countries, including the affected countries as well as the US and Europe and many others on their collaboration on accelerating. Today we have unprecedented review timings. Normally we need to wait two, three, four months. Today it's happening in 24, 48 hours. Everyone who is collaborating in, uh, in Ebola is unprecedented collaboration happening between the companies, between the regulators and between all the organizations. And I trust that looking forward 
we'll get we'll continue to go forward with the vaccine even if Ebola will hopefully eradicate it faster than there is a vaccine I totally hope that that's done we'll still will do it because Ebola will be back and then we should be ready with vaccines and you have our commitment as an industry and also from I think from the other uh, from the part my, our partners other partners in industry that will make sure new vaccines and new drugs will be available that next time nobody should die anymore from Ebola. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Paul. So let's hope that, that will be, this will be the last uh, epidemic where all we have is isolation, quarantine, safe burials. And, and also, uh, I think that um, both in terms of uh, review of grants, uh, not only for, by regulators, but also for research grants, um, we now have the empirical evidence that you can do that in, you know, in a very, very short time. And so I think for the future, there's no excuse for when it comes to other um, drug and vaccine development to go back to the uh, you know, business as usual. So if, that's you, if I may, pay, yes. uh, Peter, I want to add one more point is that also the funding has been unprecedented through yeah. uh, to the different governments in the world. They have absolutely supported massively, including the US government, the European government, the European Commission. Everyone is contributing yeah. to accelerating the funding. Yeah, also. foundations, the Wellcome Trust. The Wellcome so. Trust, Gates Foundation, everyone yeah. is doing what they are supposed to do is help this type of disease to be solved. Great. So, Seth, you know, Gavi is the main funder of immunization programs in in the world. So, how do you uh, fit in in uh, hoping that soon we'll have a vaccine? And because I know you've been thinking about it and also working on it. Thank you, Peter. And, and let me just make a, a, a couple of comments before I answer sure. the question. One is, um, you know, the, the panic that occurred in the rest of the world was a lot of the reason that we got those resources. And mm. as Paul has already said, you know, this was a vaccine, these were vaccines that got worked on because of bioterrorism. They were not worked on because of Africa. And we still today have a market failure. So mm. one of the goals that we have to come up with are new public-private ways to support the important research going on against antigens that don't have a natural marketplace. And so Paul talked about in my previous, like at IAVI, we were using uh, 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 public money to to fund work on AIDS vaccines and moving forward a range of candidates, and not just the one that Paul talked about, but all three lead candidates were invested in by IAVI and ARIS, which is a TB vaccine program, and others. And having that type of funding available is important. It often is the first thing that gets cut when money gets tough. But we need research, and as the President said, what we need is research also occurring in every one of these countries. We need capacity in those countries. We need a scientific community who can help with this, and I think that's been some of the successes in, in some of the countries. So in terms of your question, Peter, um, uh, we work in all of the Ebola-affected countries, at least in the, in the, in the developing world. And um, when uh, it was clear that people were working towards a vaccine, the board um, asked us to look at um, what we could do. And, and uh, we then put together a program. Uh, the board has agreed um, that we would uh, purchase up to 12 million doses of vaccine. Now, that number comes from the combined adult populations of the three most affected countries. But knowing that these that they may not be needed in all those three countries, or in fact we could have outbreaks in other places, and important in that is we must get to zero. You can't emphasize that enough. A few cases is not good enough. We have to get to zero. So um, uh, purchasing the vaccines. The second thing the board asked us to do is to prepare for the rollout of those vaccines. And we don't yet know what WHO is going to recommend. Um, is this going to be ring vaccination at that point? Is it going to be whole country vaccination, just health workers, or maybe no vaccination, depending upon where we are. So we have some pre preparation work to do. There's special characteristics around this vaccine, social mobilization, et cetera. The third point is to have a stockpile. So um, uh, you know, there will be other outbreaks, as you've already heard, and we need to have a stockpile of these vaccines if they work. Now, this is against one strain. These are, these are monovalent. But we also need to work with the pharmaceutical industry and put incentives in place, because they shouldn't do all this as a lost leader. We need to put incentives in place for them to create stockpiles of a second generation Ebola vaccine that would cover not just Ebola Zaire, but Ebola Sudan, perhaps Marburg, you know, perhaps Lhasa. The idea would be to try to have vaccines that would work across different places and also optimize them for temperature, for shelf life, for the other things you'd want in a stockpile and make sure that is regularly refreshed. And the last thing the board uh, asked us to do was to work with the countries and help strengthen their immunization systems again, and, and in particular also to help catch 
up with the, the, you know, things have been completely shut down. And the truth is, it's an unbelievable tragedy. We have to get to zero, 8,000 cases. But the destruction of the health system in these countries have killed far more people. And far more people are dying of the diseases that exist in these countries, the malarias, the measles, the, you know, other diseases. And so we've got to rebuild those systems and not just rebuild them, but build them to a better place. And so these are uh, some of the priorities that, that we're doing moving forward. Last thing I'd say is that, you know, looking forward, we have to think, and I'm, this is where we'll, we'll talk next, but we have to think about how we're going to have, um, you know, better ability to uh, diagnose and then to react in, in institutionally. But this other part of how do we think about which products, you know, are next and what we're going to need. And, and it's a real challenge because it's the future is very hard to predict. But that being said, we need to do our best. We have to have platforms ready that we can uh, drop antigens into. We have to have the ability to scale up quickly, and, and these are some of the things that should be discussed and maybe the silver lining in this cloud. Yeah. No, thanks, Seth. Thanks for reminding us about the vaccine. I just wanted to make a comment uh, regarding vaccines. I don't think that laboratories can find the vaccine. Just as the uh, president of the World Bank uh, cannot uh, find uh, the solutions. When uh, we speak about the, uh, vaccines, we are speaking about having a large uh, clientele. And this is not the case for Ebola. The Ebola is, being, is, affected, uh, is affecting poor people. So we need to get more and more uh, mobilized to ensure that it is laboratories who are carrying out the research, because otherwise uh, uh, we see that the market is a, a weak market. We let uh, poor people die. If Ebola was a disease of uh, the developed countries, then we would have found a vaccine by now, and that is not the case. I think that if uh, we uh, just leave laboratories up to the task of finding the vaccine, we will never find a vaccine. We We'll never find the vaccine if we leave it in the hands of laboratories, because uh, this uh, everyone who is um, developing vaccines is not necessarily a philanthropist. They are also looking uh, to make a profit. Thank you very much. Uh, just said, and that is that um, funding for um, treatments, for vaccines, for not only for Ebola, but for other, let's say, potential epidemics and uh, rare or uh, un nearly unpredictable epidemics uh, must be considered as a global public good. And therefore, there is a place uh, and, and a need for you know, public-private investments together, because it's companies that make the, the vaccine. So that is, I think, one of the lessons in establishing such fund would be, uh, you know, could be really good. And, and Seth, I think also very important to remind us that the impact of the Ebola epidemic goes way beyond the figures we see of people who died uh, from it, directly from Ebola. I mean, there are probably, as you said, more people who died from treatable and vaccine-preventable diseases because with the dwindling um, immunization levels for uh, you know regular childhood immunizations, we can probably expect some epidemics of measles and and and, and so on. So let's uh, <coughs> now open the conversation and then we'll come back to the to the panel. Um, who would like to contribute? Um, Gary, please. Can you identify yourself and uh, and. Um, I think for the translation you probably need, yes. Oh, right. okay. Yes. So, uh, President Kande, I had the opportunity to attend a meeting with you at the U.S. Department of State in, in August. And it was a time there was really no mobilization of support for what was happening in your country or the other two affected countries. Then mobilization started to happen afterwards, as you said. And I know that the, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention started to deploy people and set up emergency operation centers and start to do the type of contact tracing and other work that needed to be done to help get, get the virus under control. How important is it to establish those types of public health capabilities in your country? Uh, and and uh, do you feel you're getting the support, if it is important, to establish those so that in the future you'll have the ability to, uh, to, to be able to do that type of work, of course still supported by international organizations? Monsieur le Président, vous avez eu la transition. President, you have the, the floor. Yes, we have uh, to focus on this 
What we are trying to do is uh, establish a CDC uh, in Guinea so that uh, we can have a CDC that is uh, able to identify all the viruses. But the problem that we have nowadays is that uh, a lot of people came to us uh, to, uh, to help us uh, establish a center f to combat Ebola. However, at this time we had about uh, 15 cases or something. So the problem that we face now is uh, not so much a question of uh, building these centers, it is uh, it putting an end to Ebola immediately. And uh, we have to also establish these uh, transit centers. So the most important for us today is to try and uh, build community health care centers. Uh, these community health centers which will allow uh, communities to, uh, to uh, have health care, for example, uh, for uh, mothers in maternity wards. Uh, and we need to ensure that uh, local communities have access to health care and doctors. We need these community centers, uh, which uh, will be in the different areas, but we also need to reinforce the health care centers that we have. The fight against Ebola is very important, but we also have to uh, take into consideration that we are uh, uh, training uh, uh, our own populations uh, on how to counter this disease. We have to realize that Ebola is a very important and a very important issue to tackle, and uh, we need to uh, end it. And it is as from this moment that we need to start building healthcare centers, uh, because currently Ebola uh, uh, has uh, is now going on the uh, downward uh, trend, and we also have uh, problems, uh, for example, with cholera, because we have less chlorine, we have uh, less typhoid fever and less cholera. But despite this, we have to focus our attention on fighting Ebola by building these uh, healthcare centers in Guinea. Because as soon as we have done that, we know uh, that uh, we will be responding. We cannot wait uh, for from now until the next 30 years to respond. Uh, President, uh, that means that we are entering a new phase in the uh, fight against Ebola. Uh, yeah, I, I want to add on what the president said, because he talked about the health systems and, and the health care side, but we do need a strong public health system as well. Yeah. And what's important about that is that this is often getting ignored. The research side, having cotters of public health workers, having professionally trained postdoctorates, and look at some of the other countries and what happened. You know, we've seen control in Mali. They have a, they're doing vaccine trials there and doing them well. At IAVI, we did trials across Africa with faster enrollment times than in Europe. Um, we've seen in Uganda control of the disease over and over again with trained public health workers and DRC. So the point is that you need to have the healthcare facilities to deal with the patients, to take care of them and do isolation, but you also need people who are trained to go out and look for cases and do the, the contact tracing and the follow-up and the epidemiology that's necessary. And this in the development field hasn't been the most trendy stuff to invest in, and yet this also is a global public good, these networks of people who, with the labs associated with them. Yeah, I fully agree. Margaret, please. Peter, I think it is important for, you know, for 2015, what are the priorities? First and foremost, we must get to zero, support yeah. these countries. What I'm afraid is the complacency are setting in in these countries. So we need to guard against that. And the second point is, we must not have what we call fatigue. The development partners, and I have to thank banks, you know, uh, Donald, World Bank and other countries, the outpouring of generosity have helped us to bend the curve, to prevent Ebola to go in an exponential manner. So that's the good news. Please, you know, guard against donor fatigue. As we are speaking, we focus our attention to get to zero in these three countries. But if I tell you, 129 countries in the world have very weak public health systems to even to prepare themselves for importation of Ebola or other equally severe diseases. So we also not to forget 
supporting those countries to build the public health system that uh, Gary, you were referring to. Now that brings me to the important point about health system recovery. Seth put his finger on the most important point. We often talk about disease specific approach to you know, the way we build a system. No country in this world can afford to have a health system for HIV, a health system for TB, and one for maternal and child health, and then one for public health. So WHO has been advocating for universal health coverage based on primary health care to make sure an integrated approach, a system approach to deal with the common diseases, the important MDGs diseases, as well as public health. And that's the only way the world can afford. And it, you don't have to be rich to start thinking about universal health coverage. And so this is a very important message for the development community. And if I see some development ministers here, MDG support is extremely important. Commodities are important, but those are low hanging fruits. I commend you, Seth, you are responsible for vaccine, but you talk about the importance of health system. Without health system, vaccines do not fly to the arms of children. Without cold chain, without human resources, without infrastructure, delivery of services would not happen. And if you look at Nigeria, Senegal, and Mali, these countries, they have some health system, but they also have political commitment, political leadership, and engagement full engagement of the community and communication right at the beginning. And I know for a fact, Nigeria, they were able to control the so many chains of transmission in Port Harcourt. It's because the private sector provided the logistic support in a big way. And WHO was using our polio asset on the ground to do CDC surveillance. So, and CDC, MSF, and all partners were coming together. So again, let me go back. There is plenty of resources in the world to help countries who are not capable to deal with the outbreak yet, but uh, we need transparency. We need countries to sound the alert and the international community would come around to support countries who do not have the means to do so yet because it is in our collective interest <coughs> to have a very strong defense system against all these very ser serious pathogens. Great, thank you. Um, Donald, please. Um, is the microphone here, please, in the first row? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Let me first of all say that uh, I want to express my thanks to everybody in this room and all governments and organizations who have in the last few months thrown in everything they have to address this issue. At the beginning, we may have got it wrong, but I think towards the end, uh, we come together and we're having this result. The beginning, it was a disaster. As all of us will have to pull back and look carefully where could we have done things differently. But now I have a question for all of you here. Now that we know that, if today there was an outbreak of Ebola in South Sudan, in the Central African Republic, or in a place like that, are we able to act differently? Thanks. That's a challenge to uh, all of us, I think, who would like to uh, um, respond to that. I mean, it's, a, it's really while we're building the system, what if something will happen now, what can we do? And I think, let's hope we learn from history, because we've had uh, reports, as Margaret said, that, uh, you know, we're then, yeah, for whatever reason, not implement, yes. I, I think Donald asked an excellent question. When it is small, I mean the outbreak, when it is small in size or even medium size, we have the capability to deal with it. That big show has been in existence for 60 years. Every year, we have 700 you know, disasters, humanitarian crises, and outbreaks. And the world did not hear about that. <coughs> now, that means when they are small, when they are medium-sized, 
we have the capability to deal with it. So that's why it goes back to the important point about transparency and the capability uh, to detect early. And then once we know that we can parachute people in with partners, of course, uh, with the commitment and agreement of the country and to nip it in the bud. As I said earlier, the circumstances allow this disease to spread undetected for three months before it was diagnosed. That added to the challenge. And President Alpha Condi was correct. We did not really pay attention to the culture enough. We need to learn going forward for the um, you know, communities it is important to respect their tradition, how the Muslim community bury their loved ones. This is something we really need to learn lessons. How can we do dignified, safe burial that are acceptable to the community? The color of the body bag makes a difference, black or white. White is acceptable, black is not. And so some agencies send black color body back, and that created objection and resistance. And of course, good-hearted you know, um, NGOs who go in in space suit, and that created suspicion. So these are some of the lessons we really need to learn. Going forward, we must look at what is the cultural context, and also what is the social economic context to you know, facilitate or to drive the disease. Yeah, I think that the uh, early detection is going to be a problem in some of these areas. And also, you only look for, you only can find what you're looking for. Like nobody thought that, you know, Ebola was happening and uh, circulating in West Africa. Although we know today that uh, it has been there for a while. But I think that uh, maybe the, the biggest lesson is that uh, act very promptly, immediately. Uh, and at the risk of being accused of overreacting. And I think, for example, that WHO was unfairly criticized for uh, you know, reacting uh, a few years ago for the, uh, no, for the pandemic flu. And uh, uh, I would rather be accused of being uh, you know, overreacting than not. So, but Donald, so you've been uh, at the forefront also with uh, and engaging the African Development Bank. I think was also uh, a very, very important element of the African response that President Alpha Conde uh, alluded to. Thanks. Any other um, comments? Yes, please. I, I'm, I'm blinded by the the spots in the back, please. Yes. Um, no, the back. In the middle of the back, yes. Sorry, perhaps I should have stood up. Um, my name's Grenville Byford, I'm a writer. Um, I wonder if you could comment on what makes Ebola such a dangerous virus, and how common are those characteristics uh, amongst other viruses? Shall I say a few words about that? Yes, yes. you're the, one of the discoverers. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, even. Yeah, there was a newspaper in Hong Kong, the front page, that called me the father of Ebola. <laughs> so, uh, but that's, uh, no. no, it depends whether your question is whether, whether it creates an epidemic or the intrinsic biological uh, characteristics. But um, what I think what we, uh, you know, what we've been seeing in West Africa was what I called in editorial science a perfect storm. Uh, it's not that the virus is uh, per se very different. Of course, it mutates, and, uh, but there is no evidence that um, it is spreading faster. Uh, it is spreading in a different way than um, uh, the classic um, limited outbreaks. Um, that may happen at some point, but there's no evidence at the moment. And um, it is really a combination of slow response, of the cultural factors, the traditions, um, of uh, defunct health systems, um, you know, that all brought together high mobility. When you take the uh, outbreaks in, in DRC in Congo, um, it's actually not so easy to go from one place to another. Whereas in, uh, you know, the, the areas in, uh, you know, uh, of the three countries, you know, I saw it myself. I mean, the roads are quite good and people are moving and, and there's trans-border traffic and all that. Uh, that's not only good for, uh, for trade, but commerce, but also for, for spreading viruses. Uh, at the biological side, um, you know, 
the virus is, and this infection really needs more study um, because um, you know, up to now the outbreaks were usually in very isolated places. We don't have really all the information we need, but um, in theory it should be a very easy to contain because um, the spread of a virus can, um, you know, depends on um, the uh, risk of infection, of transmission to another person. Um, here you need really immediate body contact. It's not like measles, where for every case, you know, you have 20 or more people who become infected. No, uh, it depends on the duration of infectiousness. Since people in general die within a week or two, there are not that many uh, who are exposed, and, um, and the number of contacts, and with the exception of, uh, of some funerals, I mean, that's also limited. So in theory, it should all be simple. But in practice, it turned out not to be the case. Thank you. But Peter, can I yes? add one point? You Please. talk about funeral, just for your information. Now we did a retrospective study and look at all the cases. 60 to 70 percent uh, of the initial cases were due to uh, participation in traditional uh, burial. Uh, so uh, when people come into contact with you know, um, a disease uh, a patients and very close contact, and even now, with all the uh, communication, community mobilization, anthropologists helping us to engage the community, we're still seeing about 20% of the cases still related to uh, uh, attendance in funeral. So we need to continue to really engage uh, local chiefs, religious leaders, women group, and youth group, and uh, get their support uh, that for this, uh, very um, important period. Perhaps you know, uh, you know, we can find a way of a dignified and respectful burial uh, that are safe. Mm. Absolutely. Yes, please. Thank you so Susan. much. Uh, my name is Mariam Jam. I'm one of the young global leaders here at the World Economic Forum. Where um, are you from, please? I'm from, originally from Senegal, okay. and I'm one of the young global leaders here at the World Economic Forum. One of the things that really, um, I also blog and, and, and write quite a lot on African issues, the, the new narratives in Africa. One of the things that struck us as the youth of Africa, the new leaders uh, of Africa, the, what really struck us is our leaders gave $28 million uh, uh, for, uh, for the Ebola uh, crisis. We, we didn't hear that. Uh, we just hear, heard the World Economic uh, the WHO, uh, you know, really praising themselves for what they've done wrong and what they've done right. How can we learn from this now to give the voice to the young women in Africa? We have so many deaf, so many people are suffering in Africa because of Ebola in Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia. What can we do as leaders to learn from this? Next time, there's no, there's no much suffering. And then we really give credit to our leaders who are giving money rather than waiting for the West to do it for us. Any thoughts, uh, Tony? Would you like to, and then Seth? Yeah, the point uh, she raised is uh, very interesting. The Ebola pandemic that occurred in uh, West Africa, again, let me go back a bit. I agree with uh, the President of the World Health Organization that transparency is key. You need to understand, know that there's a problem, raise alarm early enough, take measures, don't protect or hide it, conceal it and the whole world will help. In Nigeria, communication actually helped a lot because uh, the literacy level has become quite high now, and so people were easily mobilized, and everyone understood what they needed to do or not do in the area. And I also think that the entire system was, I think the private sector worked very well with government. It was a national, a national level mobilization factor. He brought everyone together, and we worked with the government to provide solutions. I'm talking about uh, the local support. I saw during that period, initially, initially, I think the international community did not either dimension well or appreciate where what was going on in Africa, in West Africa at the time. When I, we, my foundation sent some support to Guinea, uh, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, and Nigeria also at the time. I think we were the first, even the president could confirm this, to make such a regional uh, support to, to, to people. Uh, but uh, later, the international community came into, into, into the scene, and I think the pocket got, got deeper and really helped. So I, my take here is, 
one, Ebola is a problem, but two, maybe we should dwell, in my viewpoint, less about the problem we've had, and let's learn from it and see how to prevent yeah. it going forward. And also, let us see how the role the private sector can play to help these fragile economies that have been affected by Ebola to rebuild and bounce back quickly. Otherwise, these cultural issues we talk about have a correlation with poverty, and so they will go back again to the same place, or it can spread in other parts of the world. Thanks, Tony. And uh, Seth? If, uh, if I can just compliment people. what Tony said, and I think young people could advocate, you know, the leaders of Africa have said uh, in the Abuja Declaration that we should put 15 percent of our resources into health. And one of the challenges for finance ministers is they see health as an expense and not yet necessarily an investment. You know, hopefully uh, eyes have been woken up but because it is really important. You, you keep people healthy. And they are productive. They go on to productive lives. They spend less out of their pocket. There's less, um, you know, uh, people tipped into poverty. And, and this is really an important point. So in addition to the private sector work and specific money on this, we do have to raise the level of local investment in health if we are going to build the type of resilient health and public health systems we need. Very good. Yes. Other, any other questions? Yes, please. Second row. Uh, how to manage the tension between transparency and stigmatization? Yeah. Because sometimes mm. countries are afraid to declare that uh, they have Ebola or, or a pandemic. So, uh, and this is a big question. Thank yeah, you. it's a big issue. But can you also introduce yourself, please? Because but the point you raised about stigma no, is really it's important. Of mine of President Conde. OK, thank you can, very can much, I sir. Can I attempt yes, to please, start please. here? I think if you look at your question, Spot on, yeah. by the way, and this is being transparent also with that question. Uh, the truth is, if you look at the case of Nigeria, Nigeria, when Nigerian government decided, and I, I commend highly President Jonathan's political will and the audacity to do what they did at the time, when they announced that there was Ebola in Nigeria, some even within Nigeria, some people didn't like the fact that we were like stigmatizing the country, but we went about it transparency, and at the end of the day, World Health Organization came certified that Nigeria was not, was not Ebola free, I think it gained respect for the country. So instead of a country being stigmatized, I actually think it helps to raise the level of re international respect for that country. And in fact, even the citizenry will begin to have more confidence in their own government. Because by announcing this, it curtailed a lot of poor habits, of a lot of habits and cultural, uh, cultural practices that could have led to more of this. There was massive education in the country, and in fact, the hygiene level in Nigeria today is, has never been as high as it is today. So I think, honestly, you know, it's catch you too, yeah. but countries should move towards disclosure, early disclosure, and you know, I like the fact almost on a weekly basis in Nigeria at the time there was communication. The health minister will come out and announce today we have 22. Out of 22, this number have come back home. The following people died. And so there was transparency and it created a lot of confidence that has helped. So let's go for disclosure. It helps. Yeah, and Margaret, please. I like to reinforce what Tony says. I mean, uh, I've been in public health for 40 years. And I have managed many unusual and new diseases outbreak. Across the board, all countries are very afraid to report outbreaks. Because number one, they think this may be a loss of face. Number two, they are also about stigmatization. There may be political reasons and economic reasons not to report. Experience in the past is that the sooner you report and being transparent, you would get all the support you need. You may suffer a little bit at the beginning, but the price you pay for not reporting earlier is way higher. And that's the experience in many big outbreaks. SARS in 2003, mm. and now we are dealing with Ebola. I think this is a lesson we must take home for all of us. And I'm not saying it's just uh, the poor countries who are not reporting. I have to tell you, Rich countries, middle-income countries, low-income countries, they are anxiety. We must provide incentives for governments to recognize that it is in their interest 
to report early. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And I think that goes even for businesses. I mean, you know, uh, because you could be stigmatized because you continue the business. I, I discussed this with like uh, one of the few airlines that are still flying from Europe, well, actually only one of so those airlines. In the beginning, they were stigmatized. And they said, you know, people wanted to avoid them. Now, they're kind of nearly heroes That's because right. they continue to do it. So, and I think that goes at all levels. Um, time is up and um, thank you very much for all the, uh, you know, interventions. And uh, uh, I think that the first, uh, statement we should make is that everybody said it's not over and that we have to be very, very careful that complacency doesn't set in because that's a recipe for, um, you know, a reignition of the, of the epidemic. Um, the, um, the, so that's the first priority, to end it. And then even if the world is ill-prepared, I think this is an opportunity not to be missed, this crisis, to make ourselves all better be better prepared in some way or another. I won't go into all the details, but we have very um, concrete uh, ideas and suggestions, and I hope we will follow up on that. Thank you very much indeed.